of business is a public meeting to discuss the hazardous mitigation plan update. So, the other valuable thing about it, in, besides uh, meeting FEMA's requirements, is that it actually puts some decent information together on where the hazards are, brings the departments together, and it, you know, sort of cross informs the departments as to what's flooding, uh, where the fire chief feels there are brush, brush fire hazards, um, primarily uh, <coughs> fire and flooding information part of the world. We don't deal so much with landslides. Everybody deals with hurricanes to some degree. Droughts are a regional uh, effect. Uh, so the, the value really is in, um, in most of those two areas. Next slide, please. But the state uh, makes us cover all of the areas. Uh, we, we look at flooding. We look at high winds, hurricanes, tornadoes, winter storms, earthquakes, and landslides extreme temperatures and brush fires and drought. Uh, again, this is all natural hazards, as you might recall from the first meeting. It really mm -hmm. doesn't deal with terrorism or other types of hazards like biohazards, that type of thing. Next slide, please. So we're looking to reduce, a permanent reduce or prevent losses of life um, by looking at strategies and prevention rather than letting it occur. And then we look at what's being done now by the town and what strategies might be taken up in the future. The reason this legislation was passed because, and unfortunately this continues to some degree, but this legislation was passed to try and break the cycle of disaster and rebuilding where you, you get a, a natural disaster, you rebuild it, you get another one, you rebuild it. The idea is to upgrade your infrastructure rather than to just replace it. Next slide, please. And we look at six basic tools that go into the plan. We look at prevention, property protection, public education, natural resources, structural projects, and emergency services protection. Next slide. Prevention of damages, you know, basically what the town uh, has on its books already. Uh, a lot of this tends to be regulatory. Uh, we're fortunate in Massachusetts that we have a pretty decent state building code. We take that pretty much for granted here. There are actually states that uh, don't have a state building code. Uh, there are some drawbacks to that, which I won't go into, and in that you can't exceed the state building code, which uh, leads to some interesting things if you've got shoreline property, but that's another story. Next slide, please. 
property protection, looking at elevation and flood proofing, again, uh, up to code. Uh, sewer backup protection, not so much an issue in writing, but if you live in a coastal town, it's a big deal when the tide comes in and pushes your drainage back into your, into your, main, your main street. Storm shutters, hurricane roof straps, relocation acquisition, next. And then publication, public education and awareness. Um, this is something that, you know, if you're in the field, you think you, you know, you're pretty well covered, but this is something that has to remain sort of ongoing. Uh, a lot of updates to be done. Uh, it's amazing how fast sort of people put out of their minds the last storm and sort of the effect lasts for a while and then a year or so later, they're right back to the old practices. Next slide, please. Resource protection and protection of our natural resources uh, is always uh, the best and most cost-effective way of going. Uh, we all know the role that wetlands and watersheds play in, in soaking up water and dealing with storm water. Uh, all of us know the issues of building in and around floodplains uh, and what happens when, when we get a lot of that erosion. Instead of a control, storm at our best, best management practices, I would only add that uh, when we build in the upper parts of the watershed, we get issues too. Uh, I was just talking to Gene, I was thinking, I was talking to Will, uh, the city engineer in Peabody, and they are busily uh, re, uh, <laughs> removing pavement and adding absorption in the upper part of the watershed before the water can get down to PP Square. And a lot of times we're beginning to figure that out. Um, a lot of what you guys do, I'm sure, and, and most uh, planning boards and entities do is to look at how to grab the water before it gets off site uh, and absorb it before it gets down, down, it starts running downhill. Next slide. Structural projects, which most of these plans deal with, uh, just sort of the nature of the beast. By the time we do these types of plans and talk to folks like BPWs and city engineers, uh, in addition to regulatory work, People are always wanting to remove and replace uh, and put in bigger culverts and bigger stream crossings. And, uh, and that's absolutely essential. We're also starting to see uh, projects where people are starting to, again, uh, rather than just enlarging, they're trying to keep stormwater in place and, and let it be absorbed. Next. And then emergency services protection. Uh, protection of critical facilities, fire, uh, critical infrastructure, roadways, and again, one of the key, uh, there's a key piece in here on, on communications, not normally covered, but I know one of the projects in the plan you'll see later on is the uh, addition of a, of a new cell tower, getting it off the water tower and into a new site. That was important to the town. Uh, next slide. So we've worked with the town. Uh, we, we do most of the mapping. We gather people together. And I talk to folks and then research what, the, what your regs are. Uh, we work with the hazard mitigation team. This is our second of two meetings. And then once we've uh, incorporated all the comments that we receive, uh, once the, the plan is posted, it'll be posted for 10 days in early February, we'll incorporate those, send it up to MEMA. Uh, for their approval and uh, comment, and then or comment or approval, and then on to FEMA for their review and hopefully uh, review and, and approval in a timely manner. Next, please. So these are the steps that we follow. Uh, we update our uh, first step is looking at hazard identification and mapping. We gather the team together. As for public input as well, in terms of identifying what floods, what burns, um, if you were in a landslide area, what may be subject to that. Uh, if we are more prone to earthquakes, uh, which we are to some degree, you know, where there are still unreinforced masonry buildings that would go down in, in a, a big uh, quake mm -hmm. or even a medium-sized quake. They're not as uncommon in this area as you may think. Second step is updating uh, our maps and uh, critical facilities. We'll take a look at that in a moment. Uh, and then looking at the assessment of risks, risks and vulnerabilities uh, associated with each of the natural hazards within the plan. We look at updating, uh, we look at it, the uh, existing mitigation and then updating that. Uh, what's important from a regulatory point of view. 
And then we really work pretty closely the real value in the town and, and carrying a project forward for additional PDM funding is what the mitigation strategies and projects might be. This is sort of a laundry list in this plan. It's sort of an assemblage. Um, if town staff wish to carry this forward to FEMA for, a, uh, for an ap actual application, that it's taken from the plan and there, there's more. There's a benefit cost analysis done. It's actually pretty extensive. So finally, we wind up with plan approval and adoption. Next slide, please. So we review in, in looking <coughs> at uh, mapping, we look at state and federal data on all of the elements, uh, snow play, uh, snowfall, wind speeds, uh, what floods and where. We review the state hazard mitigation plan to make sure that we are incorporating everything that the state covers in its plan because that's how we're graded. And then we get as close to the local team as we can to get information on hazard areas and potential future developments uh, and what's also been recently developed. Again, this is to try and get an idea of, uh, for starters, you know, how much pervious might be being added in areas that were previously undeveloped, not so much around redevelopment, but gives us an idea and we take a look at uh, what percentage of that land is in, for instance, uh, flooding areas or near uh, brush fire areas. So we look at hazards, uh, flood hazards, geologic winds in terms of hurricanes, and as well as winter storms. Um, and then we throw all these layers together and wind up with a composite natural hazards um, look. There's a series of eight maps that comes with the plan uh, as uh, included. And I uh, invite you to take a look when that draft comes in. This is actually one of the draft maps that so showing the uh, flood zones within the town. Next slide, please. So these are some of the locally identified hazard areas. Uh, what floods and where, according to town staff. I uh, won't read all of these, but I'm sure they're pretty familiar names. Some of these were uh, dealt with in the 2010 plan, and uh, some have been carried forward. Uh, and again, uh, brush fire examples. Did add several areas there. Uh, north of Fairchild, uh, 93 corridor goes back to the previous plan, and Bear Meadow goes back to the previous plan. Next slide. So we go back and look at the history. Uh, we're looking at Mass GIS as well as um, the climate data center, the National Climate Data Center, and, and look at history of uh, declared disasters as well as events both uh, within the county and within the state uh, and pull that data up. We get average snowfalls. We get uh, hurricane tracks and tropical storm tracks. That's the sort of greenish colored and the, the purple line going through is a storm track uh, and the yellow line is, I believe, a, uh, a tropical storm track. That this is the yellow line. Yeah. And the purple is uh, your snowfall, your average snowfall, which is uh, 36. It's actually three to four feet uh, per year average. Next slide. Critical facilities. Uh, anytime we do a, a plan update, we work with uh, the emergency folks uh, to look at updating the sites. We did that this time. Good. Almost 140 sites within the town. Um, they really vary widely. Um, there's really no set uh, plan on what they are. We list whatever the town feels is important. Uh, different towns do it different ways, but they almost all include this list that I've included here. So churches, um, critical infrastructure like dams and pump stations, no dams here, but elderly housing, uh, child care stations, <coughs> stuff like that, all the schools, emergency shelters. Next slide, please. And these are the, what I re referred to earlier. This is a uh, recent and potential um, future developments. Uh, these are areas that have either been redeveloped or uh, built, uh, built upon recently. We've got a couple of slides here. But we look at uh, 
landslide risk, uh, flooding risk, and whether or not it's uh, in a, a brush fire area, and the percent chance of flooding. You can go to the next slide, you can see that most of the incidents are pretty low here. Uh, most of your development or redevelopment over the last five years has been uh, in areas that are pretty low risk, uh, really nothing in a, in a uh, substantial floodplain or brush fire or landslide risk. Of course, this entire area of landslides is not so much a, a big deal in uh, the Northeast. We're all pretty much low incidents. Next slide. This is just a uh, sort of a sampling of uh, what Reading's got on its books for um, existing mitigation. Uh, following the 2013 study on the Arizona and the Saugus Rivers, uh, capital improvement plan was adopted. And a lot of the, the flooding measures and the mitigation projects will outline are really pretty well covered under the CIP. So I think the town's did a, pretty, a very good job in picking up what came out of that study. I'm sure you guys are familiar with it. There's a lot of work there. Um, but uh, that's, that's probably the, the standout piece in terms of you know, multi-hazard and around flooding as well. So you've got your usual um, sort of house cleaning measures, um, you know, your uh, site plan review and PUD stormwater regs. Uh, you know, you're just finishing up on your stormwater bylaw, and I think the regs will be coming through beginning on the regs uh, relatively soon as well. So. And most towns do this uh, tree trimming. Um, some take it uh, further than others uh, in terms of inventory, uh, public street trees and what's in danger. A lot of people will do just a, a basic windshield inventory. Your tree warden has got a, lo a lot of local knowledge um, in terms of you know what needs to be cut and cut away from power lines or people's homes or businesses. Uh, and uh, he's trying to put together a more extensive database of so that he can keep rolling that over uh, in, a, in a timely way. And then um, winter related uh, hazards, salting and sanding, uh, much less sanding than there, were, uh, than there used to be, and then brush fire related uh, hazards around subdivision review and permits for outdoor burning. Next please. So we look at uh, what the mitigation is, what was covered in 2010, um, what the town staff feel, where the gaps are in terms of hazard mitigation, what actions can reduce uh, vulnerability further, and really what the priorities are. Again, most of this stuff is going to be infrastructure because the people working on this are charged, and you know most of what comes up around here is flooding. So, next slide. These are the mitigation measures uh, for the plan update. Not all of them, but a, a sampling. So um, Sunnyside and Fairview is looking at undersized pipes, uh, replacing those, and a lot of this is, uh, again, carried from 2010. Causeway Road, there's a good example of a critical facility uh, gaining access. You've got some culvert issues there. There's a lot of beaver issues, uh, removal. There's, um, you guys have done a ton of work, as I'm sure you know, in terms of beaver removal, sort of relocation, and stream cleaning. And because of where you are and you know your topography and you know where you are in the watersheds, that will be in sort of an ongoing piece. Some of the projects are just sort of biannual stream cleaning, uh, beaver relocation, and that's going to be uh, that's really sort of uh, the task. Uh, some of this going forward, stormwater management plan and regs. Uh, as you probably know at this point, there's uh, a new MS4 permit on the street that's coming forward that has to be uh, up, uh, sort of complied with over the next five years. There's new requirements for that, including complete streets and regulatory compliance in the third year, third and fourth years. Again, you can see public tree inventory and risk assessment for wind hazards, uh, public safety buildings looking at studying some type of earthquake resistance. Uh, FEMA requires everybody to have at least one action on uh, all of the listed uh, hazards, <coughs> otherwise they send the plan back to us. And then again, the cell tower that I mentioned uh, that the town was, that is uh, going to be carried forward pretty quickly. Next slide. So where are we at? Um, again, uh, we're just about at the place where we're gonna post this uh, for the town's review. 
and uh, then it will go to MEMA and FEMA. Uh, once they approve it, we'll bring it back to the Board of Selectmen for a resolution to adopt the plan, and at that point, once it's adopted, you have five years from the night that it's adopted. Uh, so you'll be in compliance, you'll be able to go after FEMA money uh, to your heart's content. And uh, next slide. <coughs> so this is built into the plan, there's a timeline, uh, and uh, integrating the plans, recommendations of the local plans and studies. Again, the key really is uh, updating the plan every five years with some recommendations within the plan. Uh, it's amazing, uh, the first iteration of these plans, it was really quite easy getting them adopted. The second time around, there was a lot of, um, uh, there were a lot of changes uh, made to the interpretation of the regulations by FEMA staff, so we had to do a lot of uh, updating, but we think that we and other RPAs and other consultants that are doing these plans, uh, I've finally got a template that satisfies both the state and the federal government. <laughs> so these have been adopted uh, pretty in a fairly timely manner over the last year. That was not the case over the previous sort of five years. But um, they seem to be going through, and uh, we're hoping that uh, that's the case uh, for writing as well. And next slide. So we're going to have this up by February 3rd, and we'll have it up for 10 days. And you can send me any comments or get them to Julie, and she can send them to me. But we'd appreciate your time. If you want to take a look at anything you see that's that's missing or you, or you want to edit or send us questions, we really appreciate it any time you want to give to it. Yes? February 3rd is Friday. Is it possible to give that to me by February 2nd so I can put it online? Sure. Thank you. Sure, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. We're doing anything to advertise that it's going to be posted. And I guess that's to the three of you. Are we going to put it in any of our newsletters? Or I can get it into the newsletters that we Yeah, and um, we have a, a person in administrative services that does a lot with um, posting and getting the word out and social marketing and all that. So she's on Twitter and Facebook and all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. Gotta keep up with the president. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna be impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> Send you back to the march. Yeah, I was there actually. I, was there too. I didn't see you. You were in DC? No, no Oh, one. I was in DC. The little one in Boston. <laughs> uh, uh, so that's that's about it, folks. I think that's my last slide. All Check. right. I will check for you, but yeah, it seems like that's, oh, oh, yes, questions. questions. <laughs> <laughs> that famous that yeah. Well, uh, one question, just, I mean, I think you, you hinted at it with the cell tower and so on and so forth, but it, there's uh, the cascade effect of, you know, things, infrastructure that isn't critical until you have an emergency to handle. The, that's the kind of thing that, you, that is also included in, in, the, in the plan. Well, we really rely on, on local folks to know sort of like what needs to be done. Um, we can't pretend to know what that is, but I would say based on having read the study and talking to the, the highway folks and Ryan, um, they have a pretty good handle on how particularly the water moves through town and what needs to be kept clean and, and what needs to be updated. CIP is pretty good um, in terms of what they want to do. so I. I think that they've got a much better handle than they did say probably 10 years ago before the study. You guys certainly have a lot of small contributing streams. You've got a lot of stuff that needed to be cleaned and, and needs to be continuously kept going and cleaned. Uh, but if you do that um, and you make sure that you uh, keep all your stormwater on, on site when you uh, uh, permit new developments, right, mm -hmm. as much as possible, you, you'll, you'll be ahead of the game as much as possible. No. I was thinking uh, more along the lines of the, we had the, the gasoline tanker crash right next to the town wells mm -hmm. years back. We're surrounded by the highways right. and things like Camp Curtis Guild. Um, and if we had something like the, uh, you know, off the wall landslide earthquake, then the recovery from that or the mitigation of that requires 
the emergency infrastructure that needs to be protected ahead of time so that you can count on it you know when you're trying to to deal with a hazard or a hazard event but it sounds like the you're paying attention to that with the communications the, the critical communication stuff well you know more. that's there's always a lot of gray zone that's a great question <coughs> um, this is a natural hazard mitigation plan so we are sort of bound to, to stay with you know so we have the same situation I live in Gloucester and right. there's a we had a uh, we had the same thing happen we had a uh, an oil truck flip over next to our water supply at one point and it was on a downhill slope and uh, one thing that we did and this is really nothing to do with the plan per se because it's not within the scope of what we're talking right. about but we built a, you know, a catch basin system in a series of dry wells so that we could catch the oil before it got down to the reservoir. Well, it's a mitigation factor, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know where the town stands on that because it's really not within the study that we conducted. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I hear you. There is a, there's, a, there's a community emergency management plan for every community that's required that the fire chief has to the keep up with chief. that would deal with that. Yep, that's something so that, that, that's chief. a different plan. Yep, it's okay. called the COOP. Yep. And um, right. he's consistently updating that right. and refining that. Yep. Okay. So that's, I mean, <coughs> that's sort of where that one would fall. But it is dealt with everybody asks that stuff and it's... Yeah. it's well, the uh, also the technology marching forward, the what is involved in so-called critical infrastructure is changing on a continuous basis. Yeah. You know, if you lose your your internet connection nowadays, you're basically SOL. Right. The but that doesn't show up on somebody's list of things that you need to protect in the case of an earthquake. Well, it's interesting <laughs> with the internet connection because even though people rely on it every day, the local municipal folks don't. They always go with. Um, Either, you know, they generally will have their own radio system to rely on two-way radios um, because mm -hmm. the first thing that goes off, as we all know, when there's an emergency is nobody can get online. Uh, they, nobody can make a phone call anymore. So a lot of times okay. we'll maintain backup that way with, with their own radio systems, yeah. emergency dispatch mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So it's, it's well thought. There's many layers of uh, thinking that go into this. This okay. is just the, the natural hazard end of it, which just happens to deal mostly with flooding and fires and earthquakes, but there's, there's a lot of value in it. Hmm. So you were talking about the fact that we need to go through this process in order to request funding. Is that funding limited to addressing the strategies that are put forth here? Or if a disaster does happen, say a hurricane comes blowing through here and there's some serious damage, would we not be able to request FEMA? No, uh, you're okay. always going to have access to your emergency. When there's a state of emergency declared, this mm -hmm. this plan has nothing to do with when there's a state of emergency sure. declared. That's a, that's a separate pot of federal money. So this is updating your infrastructure, per se, but it's, it's not about disaster relief. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Get this plan Thanks. back to you. And Great. Look forward to your comments. Thanks. Good evening. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Well, next up is continued public hearing for definitive subdivision at Randall Road Extension. Julie, we had continued this because we were waiting for them to resolve any conservation issues. Right. Um.
So there yeah, was. Yeah, so okay. the last time you met with um, the applicants for this project was November 7th, and at that time, most of the issues were resolved, but they needed to finish their process with conservation. Um, and so they have finished their process. The order of conditions has been issued, and they're back here tonight to provide you an update of things that have changed and hopefully close this project out. Okay. So. And Mark Call and uh, Thomas Hector. This is Tom Hector from uh, Jack McQuilkin's uh, engineering firm. Uh, Mark, unfortunately, is not feeling too well tonight, and uh, Jack McQuilkin is probably feeling really, really good because he's somewhere in the Caribbean on vacation. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> through, through Tom into the uh, into the fire here. Um, as uh, Julie mentioned, we recently received the order of conditions from conservation. We're really good to go on that. I think uh, the appeal period expires on the 25th on that. Um, we uh, had revised uh, in accordance with uh, several of the recommendations from this commission um, and submitted to Julie uh, those revised plans. And they've been vetted by all of the departments within the town. And from what I understand, everyone, each uh, department has given a seal of approval. Uh, just to recap, uh, this property consists, uh, of, or is located at the very end of Randall Road where there is currently a cul-de-sac. And we are intending to purchase four non-conforming lots which were laid out uh, back in the 50s or the 60s um, and they're all owned by the same ownership um, and in addition to the purchase of those four lots uh, proposal was to purchase uh, the back lot or the backyard for the property at uh, 25 Springdale uh, leaving the uh, lot at 25 Springdale uh, with a conforming lot of 15,000 square feet purchasing the remainder of the back. Combining all that property, uh, extending the cul-de-sac out approximately 200 feet, and creating three house lots. I think you have all the plans that have been reviewed. No, this is all. Um, oh, okay. It was all. Um, the list of labors that are being requested. The uh, the road, the existing road at Randall Road is 40 feet wide, and so we're keep keeping that road width, the extension, consistent uh, with that width. And I think the last time uh, there was a lot of discussion of uh, uh, the curbing and you know, what the preferences right. were for uh, uh, by this this commission. Uh, so most all, you know, all of the uh, waivers that we requested result from uh, the fact that this is, uh, is an extension of the, of the existing roadway and not a, you know, a brand new subdivision essentially being put in, a brand new road I should say, uh, being put in. But several of these requested waivers had already been uh, granted by the commission in the, in the preliminary plan. We'll be working with uh, RMLV uh, and the fire department for the location of the, the hydrants, RMLV, with regard to the location of poles and wires, etc. I will work with the town and the town council to draft uh, easements that will be necessary for maintenance uh, because we're, again, we're not, we don't have sidewalks essentially because it's so small. Um, so we'll work, uh, I'll draft all the easements run by uh, town uh, department heads as well as town council. Yeah. If you have any specific questions relative to the engineering side, Tom is ready to roll. I don't remember anything significant from our last meeting. I, I think. The only thing we asked for was to make sure that the granite curbing went down at some point. That looks like that was changed. And yeah. That was, mm -hmm. that, that was really the biggest 
topic of discussion, it seemed, um, back then, because the, the preference, you know, was for vertical granite curving, but on Randall Road itself is that bituminous uh, edge. Right. Um, right. Which members of the commission did not want to have, but we also have to pay attention to what DPW was saying, which is if you have a vertical edge and not hit plow blades come in and they flip it, it's going to be damaged. So I think there's some, the plans on here to put some you had it stop right. at the filtera tree boxes. So yeah. Right, transition edge. down. Yeah. Somehow transition yeah. down. Transition, right. Um, right. Gets the item 10. Uh, item 11 um, says the waiver requires the Board of Health approval. Was that taken care of? For the water main loop? Yeah. Um, we, I know that uh, Jack did discuss that with the Board of Health. I don't know if there's anything in the final specifically in writing from the Board of Health on that approval. Do, do you see anything? Um, there? I know the Board of the Board of Health did approve the subdivision plan. Mm -hmm. um, I don't okay. remember specifically if that piece was involved, but I can find out. Um, there, I think that um, the reason that they're doing the hydrant instead of the loop was that the loop didn't make sense in this area. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't anticipate that it would be problem but mm -hmm. just dotting the eyes no definitely <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll make sure that that's in place though. but I know that the board of health did as Julie said uh, has reviewed it and took okay. can we just rephrase that in this decision of course it could be interpreted that our our waiver is only granted if some other board takes an action and I don't think I, I don't think that's our right. I think I don't think we can do that. Right. Um, uh, and that's mm -hmm. not necessarily we'll grant the waiver, but you also need to go to you know, get Okay. You need to demonstrate sort of commentary. Yeah. Right. So. Um, so just going back to um, the list, are you all set with all the waivers prior to number eleven? Because um, I'll change the wording on those to indicate that they've been granted. Um, if you don't have any concerns. Bill, you've seen this decision. You've had this. You've reviewed this decision. Yes, I have. Okay. with the sewer pipe cover? Can you raise that? I guess as long as both the sewer pipe cover and the culvert size, um, I, I assume that those uh, by this point have both been reviewed by engineering and by CONCOM and if they're all good. Yes, um, they yes. have been. Mm -hmm. Yes, they have been. Yeah, in terms of the The Board of Health thing, I think, is covered by finding number 13. Yeah, yeah I, I think David's right, so we could just strike that language from um, right. item 11. Yeah. So the, the strike that's involved this way will also require? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it takes care of the language if they missed it that's their problem but it seems too big of an item for them to have missed and I know we raised the discussion mm -hmm. oh, you're not convinced Julie <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that their approval is fine
So all items one through ten, you're okay with granting. Good. Okay. Mm -hmm. And twelve through fourteen and eleven as well. Okay, great. Thank you. So if you'd like to know specifically what's changed. I actually have a list. Mm, sure. I'll just go through. So um, on the landscape plan, they now show all trees greater than six inch DVH um, with a breakdown of which ones are within the buffer zone. Um, they've added concrete pads for the walkouts on lots two and three. They've added a limit of work to the plan. Um, and then on the in the plan set on sheet five, which is the grading and erosion control plan, They've added curbing east of the tree box filters. Um, that's um, vertical granite instead of bituminous. Right. Um, they've added the abutting curb, the curb cuts on abutting lots to the plan. That was a requirement of the subdivision regulations. A lot of these changes actually are things that I pointed out they needed to do. Um, sh on sheet six, they show um, underground private utilities have been revised to be above ground. Two utility poles have been added. Sheet seven is the stormwater details sheet. They updated the infiltration chamber table. Um, and then they added the cut and fill volume and um, to whom the easement rights are being conveyed. And they made some additions to the zoning table to make sure they covered all of the dimensional requirements. Um, <laughs> and then they made a note that the street is going to be proposed for acceptance by the town. So those are the changes. So with the discussion with the CONCON, they didn't really change. I mean, those are, those are all changes to the plan with the exception maybe of the concrete pads. I don't know if they were planned to be there or, or not. Yeah, um, and the trees. More specificity around the trees. Right, but it doesn't sound like they had any changes, substantive changes to the, the, right. the plan, not the piece of paper that you cut oh, what you were going to, yeah, no, what no. you were planning on doing. No. no. Yeah, this, in my understanding is that this list includes all of the changes I wanted and all of the changes okay. conservation mm -hmm. wanted. Yeah, I mean, that, that's really been the approach all along is to go to both commissions hearing input from both sides and then build the plans that, that work. Is there anything I was missing? Um, no, no, that's uh, really out, really well outlined. Uh, sure. Sounds like we're good. So that landscape plan was updated last year? That was updated on the 1st of December. Okay. Yeah, this I think this entire plan set is from December 1st. Okay. Yes, they are. All right, that's what I was checking. Top solar line all about. Yeah. It's just a little personal <laughs> request. Um, so it's like the worst orientation for your building, right? 
What'd you say? That gives you a big face facing south, which means you get too much heat gain in the sun. Hey, I didn't design the plan. I just noted that due to the size, shape, and orientation of the lots. Yeah, I know. I'm just going to make sure that people understand that it doesn't mean you have to put your building facing due south no. all the time. It's right. how it doesn't a lot of things happen. Conservation wants to see if there's a way to build houses with south, face, south facing roofs so that owners in the future could install solar panels if they so chose. Sure, but, but that means that there's a whole face facing north large face potentially which means it's colder more heat loss Ice um, dams. more damage from you know moisture not drying there are better ways to do that than just to say the roof faces south you could use building integrated materials you know you could use solar thermal which might be better more, more payback than solar or electric that's for sure mm -hmm. you can take it out if you want no you i'm just like it. i don't i don't mind just it a statement i don't mind it i just don't i guess i don't want it to seem like it's this um, the or this panacea or, that you know yeah. buildings got to go north south. I mean uh, east west because or I don't want it, people being punished for doing that because there's other things that go into effect. Well, we, it's not a specific requirement, so it, there's no way to punish. No, it's not. It's not a requirement. It's a preference, and I mean, quite honestly, a, a house is going to be constructed on a lot in a way in which it best fits both aesthetically as well as physically in the lot. So mm -hmm. conservation would, would likes to see Well they would they future would like homeowners will have the option of putting solar panels if they so yeah. chose. They would like you to not obstruct future development, yeah. Maybe it's picky, but during construction, the item three materials, can we re replace the phrase school kids to younger people? Sure. Why isn't it? Isn't it I don't even know. It just should just be a, a, a nuisance. Wrong with our older to people. Anyone. Yeah, it can be a nuisance <laughs> to strike the words to school kids. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You could change it to occupants or you could just end it at, at nuisance. Start the nuisance. I just ended it at nuisance. Okay. Yeah.
good. Everyone's good. Yep. Okay. Move that the CPDC approve the definitive subdivision plan for the project at Zero Randall Road and 25 Springvale Road for MGH Hall contractors as amended. A second. Second. All in favor? Thank you. Thanks very much. I appreciate your attention and for your help. We'll send you this tomorrow. We expect to have shipments of dollars to Houston and now to Pittsburgh. That's what we're expecting. I saw that in the paper. Yeah. Let me know how they are. I'm sure they can't compete. They're being shared with all the customers. So you can go in any time and ask to share. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't open it for public comment, but I just realized. That? Yeah. That I can't open it for public comment. You didn't. Oh, I'm sorry. That's quite all right. Continue. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, just just want to make sure the bases was, are covered. My, my eye line's over here. You're in the wrong <laughs> spot. <laughs> <laughs> it usually sits over here, yeah, too. Yeah, you're in the wrong seat. Sorry, I didn't know I had to sign a seat. Are you going like this? I didn't see anything. I will let you know when I need to speak up. Thank you. <laughs> Feel free, please. Okay, well, the next item is scheduled for 9 o'clock. Sorry. Was it posted for 9? Yeah. Mm, I, okay. I didn't know if this one was going to, because the last couple of times there's been a big audience for this one. Yeah. yeah. So I just didn't know. Um. Okay, and you said we don't have any minutes uh, to approve. No, I did not get to Okay, that. well, what about other planning, planning updates? updates? I mean, no. What isn't happening right now? Um, our just senior living is, is starting to um, cut. The first couple of people are starting to move in, so that's yeah, kind of exciting. They've advertised their... Yeah. Um, opening ceremony. Yes, February second. Yeah. Oh, so today's exciting. paper. Yeah. Yes. So that's that's very exciting. They've they've been um, very interested in you know meeting people in town and getting mm -hmm. more ingrained in the community. So that's very nice. Um. What else? We have um some discussions coming up on February 13th, the continued hearing on the retail marijuana moratorium and or ban, um, and accessory apartments, some modifications to that zoning bylaw. Mm -hmm. Those are both the 13th? Yep. And uh, you'd also <coughs> voted to have a public hearing to discuss 40R expansion on the 13th as well, so. We're, we have some big agendas coming up. Mm. What else is on those agendas? Um, I think Lyle Estates is also on that agenda. Okay. Which? The um, 364 Lowell, Lowell Street. One that was okay. a 40 B. Right. Yeah, they have to get me <coughs> materials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe they're not on that agenda, actually. No, it is the 23rd. Mm -hmm. When does that MS4 permit take effect? Is it this summer or is it April? I think it's July. It's the summer. So we did some, we voted for some things at town meeting. Um, we did the stormwater bylaw? Was right. It? Yeah, I mean, I don't know all the details about this MS4 permit, other than I think that the water quality ranks are stricter. I think actually, didn't it turn out at town meeting that this new stormwater bylaw that we adopted is based, is, is just bringing up to us up to speed with yeah. the last MS4 permit? Yeah. Um, yes. Right. That was our big discussion yes. about that. <laughs> um, and there's this new one coming out. And is anyone going to enforce that? So I was actually thinking about this the other mm -hmm. day that once the attorney general approves that bylaw, this is something that this board is going to have mm -hmm. to start being involved with. So we're going to have to figure out regulations, guidelines. 
that and the new site plan review guidelines as well, mm -hmm. which I have already ready, just waiting for the review. I was wondering if we could discuss 40B and subdivisions. I was thinking that, like tonight, we had a subdivision which created three new units. Uh, there'll probably be another subdivision tonight, creating probably two or three more. Which, five total. Five total, which is half of a uh, affordable housing unit. Except that the town is now responsible for providing that half a unit. And I'm wondering if there are any ways that we can uh, get the developers to help out in that. I know that uh, we're getting closer to our 40B 10% requirement, but every time we subdivide, we get a little bit further away. I'm wondering if there are ways that we might be able to uh, look at bringing that in so that when we do get a subdivision, there's something, be it, um, be it a tenth of a value or something so that we can keep track with the 40 bs going forward. Yeah, I know when we were having a discussion about the 40R, the first thing out of the mouths of the developers was that the 25% affordable number was unachievable. Immediately stood up and, and complained about that. Is that why that. it was 20% initially? Well, that's the two comments that came from the attorney rep that was sent there by the chamber and the other member of the chamber is 25 is not sustainable deal breaker. So well, really that's <coughs> that's where the work has to be done is to figure out mm. either do we do we make them defend that somehow? Show us the pro forma that says that it's not not attainable. Why? Something real, not something phony. You're talking about other types of developments. I am, but I I'm changes. saying if we're working on a on a development that is affordable base, you know, affordable unit base 40R, 40B, right? And they're resisting. You're never going to get a private developer to give you some sort of affordable. Well, that's not care. necessarily true. I was just looking at our subdivision regulations because I know the town of Concord has a provision in theirs that requires a, it's it's either above a certain number of units in a subdivision, one has to be affordable, or um, some sort of mitigation has to be provided to the affordable housing trust fund. I don't remember the specific language, and in, in my entire time working there, we only had two subdivisions. Um, but I do remember in one of the subdivisions that came up, and they did get an affordable unit. Over how many units? I think I think that was eight, and one of them ended up being affordable. Um, I don't think I've seen an eight-unit subdivision come through here in a so, long but time. But that is something I'm just saying. It's not sure. Impossible. If you can get up to that density, you could probably find mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. money on that. Or if there was some sort of payment into the payment into in the, lieu of into the trust situation. Yeah. Is it going to be significant? You guys would have to be the ones to update your regulations when you could decide how significant you want it to be. Yeah, I, I thought that, I mean, the pushback on the 25% or 20% was for the uh, larger unit count. I mean, basically, the consensus opinion, if you want to, or position is that it was unattainable for anything less than eight or ten units. And the um, small project definition in Chapter 40R, I think, is 12 units mm -hmm. or less. Mm -hmm. Right. So anything that's more than 12 units is cons would kick it into being a project where an affordable component is required. Okay. I mean, if, if the threshold is actually that high, uh, I, I doubt that it's an issue. I mean, <laughs> because at 12 units or more, the you can almost always talk them into something. Um, 12 units, I guess, would require, uh, what, three? Three or four affordable. Depending on your factor. That seems like a lot. 12 unit development. Yeah. But if it, for a subdivision, it would be, you know, an ownership project, right? And then. Yeah. 
You wouldn't necessarily do 25%. I, I mean, what we, what we should be doing, whether we can or not, is getting the value of, you know, on these two and three unit subdivisions that we see on a regular basis, at least the value of 10%, mm -hmm. right. so that we're, we may not be gaining, but at least with these twos and threes, we're not, not losing ground. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and I would think the way to do that, you know, is is to get some um, some payment to go into the the housing trust, so that you can do you can set something out up, not necessarily as part of that two two or three unit subdivision because it's not going to happen, but in, in somewhere else in, in town. What's that? No, Though, that's I don't know I whether, I mean, yeah. growing up doing zoning in Virginia, we did that. That was the name of the game. In Massachusetts is very different. Yeah. Um, and I, I never hear of that sort of no. proper system. Um, so say more. that again, zoning. In when you did when you when I worked in, in zoning in Virginia, yeah. they had pro, uh, this proffer system where right. you build a you this is a, exactly what they did. Mm -hmm. You build a ten unit subdivision and you pay the county the value you pay for um, uh, the the your share of uh, fire, your share of police, your share of mm -hmm. affordable units. And oftentimes it's just payment into a fund, or you go and actually buy a new fire truck, or you buy this. I mean, it's very you know you're buying into the into yeah. the government infrastructure. Right. Massachusetts, okay. you you can't do that. Impact um, fees. What's that? Impact yeah. fees. Impact fees. We don't right. allow it here. Yeah. Um, hmm. But I mean, it, isn't there some way, some other way to do that? Maybe you just wouldn't call it that. I mean, your payment in lieu of could be a certain yeah. percentage yeah. or something. Well, that but that's really what you're well, what I and you I get is at. Yeah. to some extent. What's that? It, yeah, I and I is 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 really specifically focused mm -hmm. on that portion of the impact. Yep. But um, one of the tools that we used when I was in a, up in Peabody was, um, and I'm not advocating for this, but it was just another way of doing it is to have something in zoning that kicks in after, and I, think, I think we had it for subdivisions and we had it for multifamily housing, but inclusionary zoning. Yeah, like a 10% requirement. Yeah, that's another alternative that's, that's to build to your inventory as you get the larger subdivisions, yeah. as you get the multifamily housing, not that we get that many, but um, to have a separate provision in zoning for inclusionary zoning. Mm -hmm. You know, it's got some pluses and minuses, but you add units. You know, we we've spent a lot of time on this, Julie and I, talking about how do we <coughs> how do we really get over the the hurdle to get ready to ten percent. And unfortunately, one big project is, and I, I mean, there's a lot of little ways you can do it, but to really get the the numbers and to really be looking into the future for the next decade. Most of the communities have done it by having one large 40B. Hmm. Which, you is, can, which <coughs> is just you. more of one type of housing. Right. Which doesn't really serve doesn't the help. It yeah. doesn't help. You know, right. there should be more ownership of as projects single family, two family, you know, yeah. two family where you can get some rent to help with your your property. Those kind of things are what we need and we just can't seem to convince people to do that. That's uh, the, in, you know, the legislature to mm. pass a law that really makes sense, and not just more apartments. It's just stupid. But for a small development like this, I, what's ten percent of that? One fifth. When you know, you can't get it in the five. So it's got to be at least ten units. Mm -hmm. And then if it is just value, if it's payment in lieu to go into some fund, what is that value? How much is that? It's tricky. On ten yeah. half million dollar homes. You know, what is the value? And then you just added 10 to the inventory. How long before that little payment you get adds up to something that counts as one unit somewhere else? Hmm. And who's going to run that? 
Who's going to manage that? We have a fund, yeah. I don't think any money has been put into it or taken out of it since the Haven Street uh, right. art development. Um, I, I haven't. Artists, you know, artists wouldn't do it either. That's a We had a long yeah. discussion yeah. with artists, and what it came down to was a very small number mm. that the housing authority was willing to accept. And that number, that payment has graduated over a period of years. So. Well, <coughs> but isn't that one of the things that we would be interested in? I mean, if, if there were a way to uh, get a, an ongoing surcharge, if you will, an affordable housing subsidy payment. So if somebody wants to go in with, um, you know, subdivision or a um, something which is just just under the threshold for the the um, per unit, they would be required to provide X dollars per year uh, into. A, a fund that would subsidize affordability yep. for perhaps existing rental properties or other um, things is you need you need not necessarily you don't have to build a new affordable unit what you've got to do is ensure that you have an affordable unit going forward mm -hmm. you, know, you need some some year-to-year -year continuity I'm not sure that there's any legal way to do that unless we create one. I'm willing to have the discussion. I just I just don't see how you'll convince the developers who want to do that to participate. Developers who want to do what? That. Nah. Well, you put it right in the subdivision rules and regulations, and if they don't provide it, they have to seek a waiver, and they just don't get the waiver. Yeah, but is that legal? No, it's like I said, done in other towns. I can look into it. If it's something you really want, want me to look into. But if it's really going to be something that would apply to more larger subdivisions, we don't get that many. Right. It's I mean, got to be. Do, it's got to be. I mean, it's, since I've been. I mean, what have we seen? I mean, aside from, forget about Johnson Woods. Mm -hmm. Take yeah, that up. before us. Yeah. Um, well, and that uh, has an affordable component. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, <laughs> right. Well, um, only 10%. Yes. And that was the problem when Johnson Woods and Brian Commons were approved. Right. We said, okay, you have to meet 10%. It's like, well, wait, that doesn't get us closer. That just keeps us even. Right. But <clears throat> we've Better seen a ton of these. Probably none more than five or six. Yeah. This is one of the larger ones. This is, yeah. Um, but every year, a couple. Yeah. Um, so you have that yeah. up after 10 years. I can you know, see somebody. Some year, you know, yeah. that's it. It's 100 units right there. There you go. So I can see where if you had a threshold number like 10, and the developer actually had room for 10. Or 11 or 12. They actually do nine because if they work the numbers right, they, they make, make more, more money, money building right? less. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no. Yeah. And that's what happens. I, I hate to be a cynic. Well, that's <laughs> why that's maybe it can't be tied to a specific number. I mean, it's maybe it's got to be worded in such a way that it's hard to get around. It has to mean something. Right. It's not like we're trying to trick them into something and it's not like we're trying to force them. If they want to be part of the community, part of the community's problem is this affordable housing issue. Mm -hmm. Not just because we don't have affordable housing, but because we don't have control over the stuff that comes in. Right. Mm -hmm. Which I think is the worst is the worst part of it. Not that you know we're lacking in housing. We just keep getting the same stuff. And it doesn't help. We can look and see what other people are doing and see if there's something. I'll look into it tomorrow. 
first thing. Did you say Concord only had two subdivisions the whole time? I was there four and a half years. Yeah, because they have a PRD process that is really excellent oh. and really works. It doesn't require town meeting. So everything I did was a PRD, basically. The common driveway, you know, all sorts of <laughs> conservation minded. Big money. Lots of land. Yeah. Tons of land in that town. Tons of land. Although a one third of the town is in permanent conservation. So. Well, why don't we buy land in Concord <laughs> as a town? <laughs> Transfer <laughs> development rights. Yeah. Something like that. That's, right? That's clever. And yeah. put all of our affordable housing in Concord. <laughs> <laughs> one big giant PRD. We just did a big it's giant PRD. Over. Actually, in Brad Lathan, that's the <laughs> attorney. Oh, yeah. phone call tomorrow from lots of people in Concord. <laughs> <laughs> people watch this? Is that what you're saying? No, it's almost nine. Anybody who's been watching this has already fallen asleep. I assume that, yeah, they're like, we're, our nice, your nice, calm, quiet, soft-spoken voice is like lulling people to sleep. They can't even hear me. So no, they can't. I can't half the time, so. Okay. I'll speak up. It's good. Project. Uh, anything else? What's the latest on Perfectos, which appears to be completed, but there was some note in one of the papers about something? I didn't see that, but um, I sent an email out to uh, staff to ask that very question. Had the building inspector been in it? Had the plumbing inspector been in it? Had the electrical mm. inspector? Had the conservation? administrator had anybody else help and um, there's been a very sparse uh, amount of uh, ability to get in so we've had a um, like a rough inspection the building inspector mm -hmm. went down for the rough conservations had probably had the most involvement just to make sure that they're following their order of conditions because they don't need to get in the building is they don't need to get in the <laughs> building that's right that's right but health, I don't think, I don't think anyone from health has been in that building. Yeah, I worked at the Spectre's office like a year ago. Oh yeah. Really? Yeah, they were done a year ago. Mm. It's going to be all new plumbing and electrical <laughs> technology. <laughs> well, the other well, thing, the uh, uh, ancient Sitco, the station on South and Main Street, the put up the construction barriers and they removed all the pumps and they're redoing that whole thing. Mm. So that work is in progress mm -hmm. as of the last couple of days. Well, and Burger had King to, too. They had the timeline, yeah. um, the DEP timeline that they had to meet and I think they only had a few months left on it. Okay. Um, so so they got pushed. Yeah. yeah. Burger King had it. Because I was in Burger King yeah. a weeks ago and they weren't I went by it this morning and they it's all been, okay. the skin's been removed and yeah. And there's also the um, demolition delay, the bridal shop, I guess, on Main Street. That's that demolished. It's yeah. gone now. Yeah. And the, that work is in progress in, in some fashion. Yeah. Is the second building gone? No. I, think I, I don't think it the was. Second, last week when I drove by, the second building was still there. No, that's still yeah, there. The residential. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so Perfecto's. Um, they say they're hoping to open sometime during the month of March. Um, <laughs> Health has to get down there for a pre-opening <laughs> inspection. And then the owner is aware of it. So, But no one from Health has visited the site. The, <clears throat> um, and it may have been an illusion, but it looked like some of the one or two of the decrepit houses on the east side of South Main Street had had some work done. And do we have an idea on building permits that may or may not have been? Like we've got the the haunted house next to uh, Dynamic Sports, mm -hmm. which looks less decrepit than it was a few months ago. Well, are they just that's theirs. Complying with the vacant properties by law? Yeah, we've, we've had very minor things that we've been working with them on, but it wouldn't be anything 
They they're they're not you know they're not from a regulatory point of view they're not at a point where we can really take action. No, it, it was just a matter of if you had heard anything. Um, no. Over the counter, if you will. Yeah. Speaking of um, oh, that, made me think about how um, you know we have a um, a um, w we ask that businesses turn their lights off um, when they're out of business. Um, and, and I'm thinking really about the one next to, um, to um, Perfectos, because they do. Um, they turn that off. But it seems to me um, that the town doesn't follow those same requests. Um, most notably the high school parking lot is lit up 24 hmm. 7 uh, I, I don't I that goes to the you know they could just like we ask uh, businesses to do in town they you know we there's security lighting around the building um, but I'm not sure why why we spend town money lighting up the parking lots. Um, mm. I think most of, I know the high school one is. Mm -hmm. So they're not even on sensors? They're not like, the, the big parking lot lights sense. aren't on sensors? No. I'll ask Joe Hogan tomorrow. We're actually, we got a grant from the state and we're change, swapping out the light fixtures in this building for LEDs. Like I know the one at um, Coolidge is turned off. Mm -hmm. um, because yeah. that, that gets dark back dark. there. Yeah. Um, but I know the, the high school lot is on. Um, hmm. Good question. No, it might just be the high school. Because the one over at Parker, I know it's turned Which off. Which one? The two, the two on the uh, pack side and the front? Or all three areas? At the high school? Um, that The big one by the Performing Arts Center? Yeah. It's always all lit up. Hmm. And I think the one on Oakland Road as well, that's sort of like mm -hmm. a little bit higher, I think that's right. all lit up. The one in the back isn't. <laughs> where you would think, where you, know, you would think it might be opposite. Yeah, maybe know, somebody overrode one, of the, overrode one of those sensor systems or something. And I assume that the um, they're working, what we heard, right, they're working on the lighting for the library to fix whatever it's like some of them already had the Did shields put on fix? not all of them not all of them yeah they were putting some sort of shields Shielding on them because mm -hmm. that's lit up like disney world that neighborhood now <laughs> <coughs> worse lit up like walmart <laughs> that's pretty bright it is it's a nice soft soft brightness soft yellow but it's still a lot of light. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyone want to take a break until uh, sure. Sure. Okay. Sure. Sorry about my bad planning.
up in the public hearing. If you haven't already signed in, please make sure you do so. And if you choose to speak during the public comment period, please state your name and your address for the record. Please sign in. Uh, in the back corner there by the door, there's a sign-in sheet. That'll help with spelling your name. Next up is a public hearing for a definitive subdivision at 1260 and 1264 Main Street. We have a public notice. Okay. Um, notice is hereby given that under Mass General Law Chapter 41, Section 81T, and Section 6.2.1 of the Reading Subdivision Regulations, the community. Planning and Development Commission will hold a public hearing on Monday, January 23rd, 2017 at 9 p.m. in the Selectman's Meeting Room at Reading Town Hall, 16 Lowell Street to consider the application for a definitive subdivision submitted, submitted by Mass Equity Investments, LLC, on behalf of Donna L. Smith for property located at 1260 and 1264 Main Street, assessors mapped uh, 45 lots 104 and 106. A copy of the application and associated plans are available <coughs> to the public in the Public Services Office at Town Hall Monday through th Thursday, 7.30, 5.30, and Tuesday, 7.30 to 7. Right. Thank you. Um, Julie, do you want to give us a quick update or do we want the uh, applicant? Yeah, we update. So um, this um, project site consists of two parcels, um, 1260 and 1264 Main Street, and they're on the left side of the road as you drive north on Main Street. Um, the area is in the um, S20 zoning district. Five lots are proposed, but there are two existing homes, so it's a net total of three new lots um, will be added. There is town of Reading owned land to the west of the site, and then a little strip to the north of the site. Um, the parcel to the west is under the control of the Conservation Commission, and Conservation Division, sorry, and um, abuts Kirch Hamlet. So it's, um, abutting, you know, a conservation area. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, for the record, my name is John Tilton of Williams and Surprises in there. Um, Julie, I did a better job describing the property than I would. But, but yes, it's a proposed five-lot subdivision at 1260, 1264 Main Street. Um, and there are two existing homes. I don't know if you can switch to the existing sheet two, I think. Existing conditions. This one? Yeah, thank you. So this is the existing conditions plan, it's in your packet. Um, existing house yeah. here with a pool in the back. This is the par parcel, 1264 parcel here. The existing house in the pool in the, the back. The other house at 1260 is right there with the shed. It's the small one in the front. Okay, so that's how it exists now. If you go back to the other one, to the south. Thank you. This one? Yes, thank you. Excuse me? Do you want me to zoom in? That's fine with that. Okay. So she said um, the, the two parcels about uh, Rocky Road subdivision here, uh, the town of Reading, and the Kirshen, which is attached, abuts this property up to the left. Um, there is a town of Reading easement through here, you know, right away. And um, the lighter green is a wetland system uh, adjacent to the property. What we're proposing is Five lots is you know, five with four new houses, one existing house in the front would remain where it is. Um, we plan to do some uh, alterations to it. Um, and what we're doing is we're removing the driveway that is on Main Street <coughs> and attaching the driveway here to this lot, moving all the access driveways off of Main Street and providing a 340 foot roadway um, through the subdivision. Um, we're proposing a 30 foot wide paved roadway the 60 foot layout um, and a cul de sac of 45 um, feet uh, radius, 90 foot diameter, which is um, consistent with the rules and regulations. Um, each house will be serviced by a new water line, interval services to each house, and a force main. Each 
the new block, including the, um, the existing house, will have its own um, force main to a major force line, line here, which will discharge to a main hole up top, uh, about 150 feet um, on Main Street. Um, the drainage system. So a as you look at the lot, looking up this way is toward Wesley, the topo goes from left to right, down towards the wetland. So we graded the plan, so everything kind of sheet flows to the roadway, picked up through a, a drainage system of catch basins, two in the back here and two more in the front here. In the back, we collect the water here, it's discharged to a, a detention pond, open air detention pond here, and mitigates into the wetland system. In the front, we capture the water by catch basins in the front here to underground um, subsurface storage chambers here. We want to put it underground because uh, we didn't want to Pinch upon right up front and also with the, with a mass highway, there's some limitations as far as tying into the drainage system. So we're proposing this to be underground here, give it more a flat lawn in the front as opposed to a big giant detention pond. Um, what we've done here too, so we the road ends about the right away as proposed, uh, about 340 feet here. But we're maintaining a future um, access easement to the town running property. That's in case in the future they decide to access it. Um, the right of way we're proposing meets the town right away requirement for roadway. So in the future, if the town decides to do so, extend it away and just the, the property here, we're um, enabling them to do that through our design. Um, in the meantime, we're proposing at the end of the, the uh, sidewalk a walking path that will connect into the private property, I mean the town running property here, Kind of dead ending here. I know there's some uh, trail systems. Um, I'll put this one off. Julie has this plan. But this is the Kirchin yeah, Woods. Yeah, hold yeah. on one second. I can. I don't know if they have that one. I do. It's the GIS. Um, is that what I called it? Yep. I don't know if it's called that. It's not here. Um, I think it might be. Okay, good. Thank you. So here we are, here's the subdivision here. Here's Kirchin Woods and the abutting parcel to our property. So we're proposing a, kind of a walking path to that back parcel, which will allow um, a future trail system to attach to our subdivision and bring it right out to the uh, main road, if possible, to your only connection from um, Main Street itself. Um, so that trail will be part of our, our design program here. And then, um, with the subdivision, the layout of the lots and the roadway system. So that's kind of a quick summary of what we plan to do here. I know there's a lot of questions and comments we got back from conservation, um, engineering. Um, so we, we know we have more to address down the road here, but this is just a quick quick summary of what we uh, our proposal uh, is about. Okay. Right, questions from the board. <coughs> well, at what level of detail? I mean, I did a drive by this afternoon uh, and noted, and it was showed up in one of the, the documents the change in elevation on the uh, existing house, which is south on Main Street of the proposed access road. And that's a uh, Substantial change in elevation. Right, from this house to this house. Yeah. Yeah, it slopes here. It flattens out towards well, but it rises quite high here. Right. So we kind of, you're right. It does do that. Um, I didn't know if there was a, a plan to uh, do more grading, or if that was you were going to preserve the existing uh, profile and, and work around it. So, um, Julie, if you go to the, um, the topo plan. Do you remember which one that is? Maybe, uh, three sheet five? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Let me just stop. So it's coming to the roadway here. W these last lost three will be on the flatter we, we grid, so it kind of works with the, the contours here. And these houses here, too, they're, they're rised up, so we are trying to make, we're not going to have, we don't want to have large retaining walls in the back here. So this back grade is pretty consistent with back grade. Um, that puts up to the properties, uh, Rocky Wood Terrace. 
and this one too, so we have a swale here. But these houses to the left will be up higher, sitting up higher, and the houses to the right will be more at the street level. Uh, these are pretty dry vines. So the idea was we didn't want to bring a lot of um, blasting or drilling in there. We were trying to make it as best as possible. The full foundations, though, so we'll, these will be dug out holes, but the top of the foundation will be pretty close to the existing drains out there. What happens on that first house that's remaining with the detention pond? Where the detention uh, subgrade detention system is? Right here, so yeah. This, this is the uh, subsurface detention unit. Right. And uh, so is that on the property of that house? It is. It's a property of this house here, and we have an easement, a drain easement, which would uh, secure the, around the detention pond itself, I mean, the subsurface drains. And discharges to the well. So the like a lawn area flat that's in within the easement would restrict it to drain only. Okay, so what what can that property owner do there? Can they put structures? Will they know not to do anything on there? Well, it'll be an easement. It'll, it'll, I mean, the deed will reference that it is a uh, easement, restricted easement. So now, if they were to come for the building department, um, they would be denied to build anything on top of that because there is an easement restriction. If they came to the building department, I don't know. I'm sorry. How would the building department know? Well, the building department, if they came for a permit to try and do some sort of expansion, they'd see it. But I'm thinking about them when they don't come to the building department to start putting sheds and other storage out there potentially. I know it's on the front, so hopefully they right. won't do so it. Right. So I mean, as you, if you need a plot plan, the plot plan would have to show the drainage on in, in the easement itself. So therefore, if you picked up, you can't put a structure on top of the easement. A shed would be allowed, but. Um, as far as um, house itself, no, it's not allowed in the easement. Okay, what kind of outstanding issues do we have with engineering? about the sewer grinder pumps and how that's all gonna right so I, I, I talked to engineering there's a main hole that's downgrade it's way down here and there's a main hole up here um, the gravity the system would be down to the middle here but that's going on there's this is brook here and um, uh, wetland crossing so I asked engineering um, could we tie into this main hole here with um, individual um, grinder pumps each house. He said yes, he does allow that. So each house will have its own grinder pump. It's, we showed the dot here, we'll be more specific yeah, in the next plan. But each house has one and it ties into this main line here. So each house here, here has its own service to the main line here that it pumps up to the main hole, the existing main hole located on Main Street there. And how long is that that it's pumping? What's the distance? Um, 150 feet about from here, probably 130 from here to the existing new hole. Uh, these houses back here are pumping an additional 300 feet down the roadway itself. In the, in the elevation difference, I mean, 20 feet. 20, yeah. I mean the, the, the it looks like the ground elevation is like 20 feet, 20 foot difference from yeah. It's, yeah. It's about that from here to here. It's probably 15, 20 feet. I can't see the grades there for me either. Yeah, so that's why it's a pump system. So if you're pumping up that way, you know, we'll, we'll design these specifically these homes. And Ryan, uh, principal, did say he wants to review the specs on that. And we have to run a system before the issue of uh, obviously permit on the property. So he'll be involved and he'll be overseeing these pumps that we propose. The, uh, the houses? You have to force main this because you're getting to a manhole that's uphill. 
If we were going the other way, would you have to use the force main with the grinder pumps? Um, we might back in this spot here, because it does sit pretty low, and pump it back up here. Maybe to this point, because um, we have a hill, you know, the road goes up and down here, this point. But the, the sewer road manholes is down here, and to do that, this existing brook here, we have to go underneath the culvert. So I don't know, we don't know the depth of that. If we can get back in the depth of that manhole, we can actually make that, that <coughs> up and under. So it might need an additional pump at some point to get back up to that manhole on the other side. And we did talk around, he thought this was probably the best solution. Uh, I'm assuming that at some point the town would be expected to take this street, to own this street. So each of the pumps is on the property and it's maintained and it's the owner's problem. That's correct. Issue. <laughs> until it's until it's not. Until someone has to hot tap a force main. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Uh, you know, it's the same as you have your own individual septics, and you're responsible for that. They'll be responsible for their, their own grinding pumps. There's backup systems, a lot of so, uh, maintenance programs. So it's something they'll be aware of when they purchase the house. I know, but it's not going to a septic system. It's going to a force main down the street. Right. You know, if, if they start having a problem, it's, it's bubbling up in their backyard on a septic system. It's not, it doesn't mean we have to tear up the street or something. I don't know. That's a tricky one. Hmm. Looks like they want to line up the force main into the center of the roadway. Yeah, that's correct. So we have it just off the center here, um, sneak up the road. Ryan asked us to, first we, we brought it here and we took it out of the sidewalk and we're gonna come on our property this way. Ryan principal suggests we just come con continue down the sidewalk. We'll um, redo the sidewalk over, then straight up the middle of the street, more like that. Which we agree, that's, that's uh, uh, something we can do. And <coughs> it's actually, it's a good um, point on his part that uh, just continue straight down and right down the middle of the road. You're actually proposing all of those trees? Yeah, I think that's based on the, the town requirement. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm on center, but yeah, we're proposing all these trees in the right way. So what about this issue with the detention pond and access to it? Yeah, so what he's saying here is if everything needs to be cleaned out, um, he wants to look at it in so with some type of small machine. So we provide access here, but I think he wants more, it's hard to see it, you might see your plan to get in here. So what we do, we'll, we'll work with it, we'll regrade it um, with an easement. Maybe lawn, but maybe one, sometimes if something gets flawed, there might be a machine down there, uh, maybe five, ten years from now. There'll be long, but there'll be easement providing access to here. So what, this will be like two to one, three to one slope. And we kind of pull this wall back so you put it in there with a small machine if you know, one of the structures needs to be replaced. So we, we will make that change as we request it. like the engineer is recommending a traffic study, but I thought I saw that on the list of waivers. Yeah, we asked for a waiver on that because we're, our point is that there's two systems homes, we're only in three more, so we don't think a traffic study. His, but his question was, what's site up this way? So yeah. I think we can address that. We, there are, there are um, site easements here and here, so we have the right to cut those trees down and maintain the person with this ownership here could not put plantings in here, could not put a shed or large trees. So his concern was, it's a sight line up here because it, it all kind of reaches up top here. But we'll, 
do a narrative about uh, finding each community with some pictures to address that. But as far as a traffic study that's running numbers, I think the three additional homes is really, we didn't feel it was necessary. Do you think you're going to see some extra traffic because of that connection up into the woods? You might see some here, um, more than that thing, but we have an open space here for uh, a few parking spots, but we're not expecting a large number. You know, I mean, I understand the concern about traffic on Main Street because of the traffic on that stretch is tends to be high speed you know close to the 40 mile an hour speed limit uh, because there's there is a fairly unoccupied stretch north of the proposed um, entryway and there's a substantial grade change I mean it's like from the the rear of the house on lot one to the uh, roadway is a almost 15 foot elevation change mm -hmm. uh, so you're coming up coming out of there up a hill blind uh, heading south with higher speed traffic uh, I'm the topography of the of the project is a little bit uh, looks tricky at best. Yeah, there's space grade here, but, but you know, we, we kept in mind as to the minimal grading as possible on the site. So it does rise up here in this area. Like I said, we're, we're trying to work the grades best we can. And his concern was, you know, what more than the never as the cars come out of there was more of the sight line looking up this way. Um, so but I think his concern could come in here and take the left hand turn. The traffic's coming this way. But we'll address that. We'll do an aerial on it. We'll take some pictures, um, explain more. As opposed to traffic study, we're you know, doing traffic counts. Um, the only traffic we get is coming, uh, what numbers we'll get are coming on Main Street. As far as three additional homes here, it's a little minimum as what's coming out of there. So. Well, just <laughs> minimal change doesn't mean that it's currently safe. Right. And we yeah, do so it's not about your typical traffic study, like the, how many more right. um, trips are generated, but I think what you're hearing is it's not only the safe sight lines, but the acceleration right. issues mm -hmm. coming out of the coming out of that road. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I assume that to some degree there's some of those same sorts of issues with the other right. cul-de-sacs. Right. Right. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, this one might be a little bit more have a bigger issue because of the, the grades exactly and the right. sight lines. So, so I think it's a little bit more than looking at just the sight lines, but looking at, um, the speeds at average the speeds and the acceleration time yeah. and gaps in traffic during um, during um, periods. Right. So, you know, we have no problem doing, I guess, analysis. Yeah. I don't, uh, as opposed to full traffic study, we are setting out the strips up and down. Yeah. But we'll address, you know, Ryan's questions and his, his concerns mm -hmm. about that, and I will meet with them with the narrative and see if that satisfies him. If not, we'll you know we'll move forward from that point. You, you need more than pictures because you have this exact scenario across the road on Pearl Street with all kinds of traffic restrictions because of that same scenario. Yeah, free traffic coming up pretty well. Across the main street on the uphill going across the grade, tough sight lines. Say there's a lot of restrictions. Well, well the, the Pearl Street. There's Pearl Street cut near yeah. this, and there's the Pearl Street up across from right. Frank. No, no, there's a Frank Mill Street, <coughs> and the other side of Pearl Street got the turning restrictions because they couldn't delineate traffic study between the two curb cuts of Pearl Street on which traffic was going where and on the accident. Yeah, they've, they've got Pearl Street has got the two one way. Connections to Main right. Street because Pearl Street is a grade going uphill, and you're turning right going on a f either further grade uphill, and you can't turn left anymore because of it. Because you want to, like, you want to tell me how many cars were pushed and hit in my front lawn because of it? <laughs> <laughs> so do we want to allow this analysis and see what it looks like? And I, I, yeah, I would think so. I don't, I don't think 
I, I don't think that a typical traffic study of generating numbers, additional, additional numbers, does anyone any good because it's not. He's right. I mean, three additional houses. That's not going to be the issue. It's right. the issue is the safe turning and the right. acceleration um, and the right. gaps in the traffic during peak periods and turning left. Yeah, it's more of an intersection analysis mm -hmm. rather than a traffic right. study yeah. per se. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you have any other issues with the request from engineering? So we did, uh, um, we have a waiver list on the, on the front. One was in regards to the, uh, the tree lift. We identified the tree six inch canopy for the um, so the last CRT, we were encouraged to look at those. We know conservation is actually formed, so. We submitted this, but since then we've actually looked at the trees. We're not going to ask for the waiver, number one, um, because conservation wanted it. I know um, we mentioned the RTV getting so that will be revised, taken off. Um, okay. Now the third, the second one was the traffic study, so we just addressed that. The third one was the cul-de-sac um, for a waiver. It was the island in the middle of the cul-de-sac. I'm talking to engineering, they're saying that they didn't like it there because of plowing issues, and also if this road was there to continue for some type of use, um, what would happen is that the cul-de-sac would be, would, be, would be cut back to 30 foot right away, continue like that, and he said right in the middle would be the island, so he, the engineering, did not want to see the island in the middle there, so uh, we, we took it off our plan, our plan proposal. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were gonna put it there, but it was under, their request that we remove it, so that we put it as a waiver on our plans. Mm -hmm. Are you showing waiver. sidewalks on both sides? So we, we're, that was our waiver is um, sidewalk on one side only. We have it on the right hand side to here. We just got the side, size of subdivision, um, three additional lots. And we're just proposing sidewalk on this side and then attach it to the proposed pathway. And the reason we did that, one reason is, um, it's a 60 foot right away, the pavement's 30 feet wide, a lot of pavement. Uh, we were shooting for 24, but we engineering wanted to see 30 um, for um, sideline issues up and down the street, also for fire safety and the police department was at DIT, they had some concerns, so, so we went back to 30 feet um, so we have a lot of impervious area. So we were proposing sidewalk on one side and leave this side grass as more open air. So it wasn't much pavement you see just look down to the roadway. 30 feet is awful wide. Um, the width of 28 south and pave, pavement is 42. It's only 12 feet wider than our proposed road. You know, that's how much pavement you're getting there. So um, we were asking for a waiver of sidewalk on one side only. I'm sorry, and how, how long is the road from, yeah. Up from here. Yeah. It's 337 feet. If you have another, you know, we show up kind of a parking area here, another 10 feet, and then the sidewalk on the back. So 342 feet from, from the, okay. right from there to there. And I didn't mention, it, we're, sh we're showing open space parking area in there. Um, we weren't going to line it. Um, the reason being, I went to Ashley Place in, in Ray. They had the same thing. They didn't line it. It's just an open spot. I had a picture here. You can see what they did out there. Things, uh, the idea of it was oh, just for yeah. the Poland Park, um, having line spaces at the end of the cul-de-sac, I didn't want it to make it look like a office park. I thought it just leave it open. Um, if you did line it, then we started talking about we need handicap numbers, so it's more or less you can just pull off there, unload your bikes, or uh, park your car here. Three right now. Um, yeah, you probably get four there. But it was just to get cars yeah, off the cul de sac. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We could line it if you wanted to, but our proposal is to leave it like it's kind of not lined. But it's, it will be clean. Yeah, Julie, it looks like one of your comments is asking to potentially put the sidewalk on the other side. Uh, no. Um, What's conservation? <coughs> conservation had 
asked to move it to the other oh, side because they thought it would reduce the layout, but it won't. Okay. I mean, that's correct, right? Like, if you move it to the other side, that it doesn't make anything further from the wetlands. No, we can't. Because the layout is the right. Layout. Right. And I don't know if you, we can put it either side. I didn't, I mean, as Thomas, I don't know if you just thought had the pavement farther away from the wetlands than we were before. I, that's, that yeah. Might be. Um, we can move the other side. It doesn't matter. We just pick the right hand side. Yeah. I think he also thought it would shift everything. Right. Because I thought, talked to him about it. Right. So he thought we're putting the pavement over here, we'd slide this what right. we can. The houses are locked in with setbacks and configuration. Mm -hmm. okay. However, reducing the pavement width could move. Reducing the layout could move. Right. Originally, we had, we were requesting 20 foot foot wide layout. I mean, uh, 50 foot layout, 20 foot pavement. And that would push everything forward. Um, you have small detention ponds. Um, everything's farther from the wetland area. You have more green space. Um, the 30 foot layout, foot, 30 foot wide pavement really pushes this out. That's our requirement. That's our right. subdivision requirement. Mm -hmm. Any benefits of reducing it? What's engineering want? They want to put 30. We really had, we showed 24 originally in the PRT meeting, the first one. Uh, we want, for plowing and snow, you know, the mission the snow's pushed off the roadway, and it's in the roadway, so he requested 30, so we moved, we moved back with 30. The other two waivers have to do with the basin slope, which engineering is okay with, and then using HDPE pipe instead of reinforced concrete. What's your thought on that, John? Any thoughts on that? Is that something engineering typically yeah. waives? Yeah, so he reviewed the plans and he didn't have an issue with that. Yeah. Or, or something equal we're saying. Mm -hmm. And he didn't comment on that. It'd be better than concrete these days. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Sorry, what did you say, John? I said that might even be better than concrete these days. <laughs> Things have changed. Things have changed. Yeah. That's it's a different discussion. For another yeah. day. <laughs> well, and start incorporating more low impact stuff into it. Yeah, yeah and just Certainly different materials at. that are being used and different pavement widths. Okay. Let's see if we can't get through this uh, yeah. This <laughs> next couple of months. <laughs> right, yeah, maybe not, maybe not you know, Immediately. this yeah. month, but. <laughs> okay. All right, so you've got some work to do with engineering's memo. You still have some things to do with conservation. Mm -hmm. You haven't inventoried the trees yet anyways, right? You have not inventoried those trees yet. We have them on the plan. We haven't submitted it. We actually got them two weeks ago. We're planning on submitting the conservation filing, I believe, Wednesday. And we'll include that in that plan set. But so we did locate not just about the trees in the entire park. So we didn't have it here tonight because we had submitted it prior to location. So we'll have that plan for you. Next okay. Mm. Anything else from the board? Well, there was, uh, and I'm not sure I can find it on a particular plan, but we've got the um, easement, we call it future roadway easement. Um, and I noticed that in the uh, subdivision of the properties, if that ease that future roadway were ever um, converted into a real roadway, you would be swapping uh, portions of the property right. to maintain. You basically you'd be changing the lot boundaries right. to maintain the uh, lot area uh, minimums. That's correct. Is that part of the? 
the plan i have no idea what the town position is on on actually, that kind of thing there's actually a provision in the subdivision regulations for just this exact scenario okay um and yeah. is this compliance <laughs> to, to my knowledge yes yeah. okay we've done it for the past and what is it this will be landlocked so we're providing future access if they ever decide to use it if so so we would swap back and I don't think you want to roll over the cul-de-sac with an extension on it. So what would happen, right. we would eliminate the cul-de-sac mm -hmm. as part of the approval process for the future, if future use of there. And then this parcel and this parcel will become a part of the right away of the easement. And then this parcel will go to lot three and this part to lot four, and that would meet the zone requirements. So we right. all the math is figured there. It was a little tricky, but we were able to figure out the right, and make sure the houses would conform to any new setbacks of a new lot line. Okay. I mean, it looked like you you had done it properly. I was a little bit surprised to see that the uh, the calculations had, had been looking that far forward. How does that impact the drainage? So, our drainage only in between now, so it's what we're proposing here. So, if new will we come in here, they would have to come before you with you know, their design and drainage, they have to accommodate for additional drainage here. So they'd have to figure out, it's like us, you know, with our subdivision as to 28. Now they have their own drainage system, so we have to figure out well, how we're gonna make ours work. And unfortunately with Mass Highway, we can't tie into that. So everything is, is uh, mitigated on site. So any future work, they'd have to do their own mitigation, drainage design, incorporate with ours. Well, this future roadway plan actually makes sense to have the force main down the center of the right. proposed road. Right. Right. Yeah, and, and the force main in the large main, they'll be sized so that you can, you can use that existing lines okay. to, for you know, future use of the roadway there. So you want to bring new lines up for the main street. Well, we don't really know what that is up there. I mean, it's <laughs> conservation land, right. isn't it? Yeah. So if it converts into some sort of developable, developable <laughs> parcel, that eight-inch line could be too small, actually. Yeah. Probably for the future. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, anything else from us? Sure. Staff, nothing? Any comments from the public? And I'm just across from it, and I just wanted to make sure you, you guys are aware. Um, I have a circular drive where you're planning on putting the roadway is my northmost part of my driveway. I never go out of that way because you just can't see up the roadway. The, that elevation is pretty significant. And then the other piece that you may just need to be aware of is with the change of the traffic pattern at Franklin Street, what happens is, is that at a number of times the uh, roadway backs up. In fact, it's backed up probably a couple of times a month all the way up to my house waiting to go through the light. And so therefore the people in the, the other lane just go flying down thinking there's something going here. So they're actually going a little faster than 40 miles an hour. <laughs> um, I would say there are people who go probably close to 60. And it's just something that you just probably need to take into consideration. I mean, I know on average people are probably going close to 50 going down that roadway. So, so um, even going forward, uh, 40, it, it does sometimes back up quite a bit because people are in that process of merging right there to get down to one lane because of the change of traffic patterns as you go north. On the other side, I, it's not as bad because they're coming from the one lane to the two, but sometimes you get people racing up that. Okay. Well, I know, I mean, this afternoon, the, uh, as I was slowing down to take a look at things. Oh, don't the, slow down now. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the traffic behind me uh, let me know that that was not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I, when I try to, when I go to go into my driveway, it, it is, I put my blinker on well in advance, and they're still right up against right. my car as I turn it to my driveway. 
So I'm just, it's just something just to take into consideration. It's not really going to be, you know, a few more houses. It's not going to probably be that big, but those people may be having, yeah. depending on which way they're turning or what's happening, it could have the same effect as what you see at Pearl Street, too, where it touches right there. Right. Um, but it may be worse because you do have that elevation change. And it is pretty, I mean, I don't just go from one side of my property to the other. And it, it can be sometimes, I can notice it. Um, but then there's the house next to me, and they have to leave that. And they're a little bit more north, and they have to leave from there all the time. And they don't seem to have a, too much of a problem. Hi, I'm Stephen Scullin. I live at 1252 Main Street. Um, <clears throat> and I have a couple of questions. When they put in Rocky Road, there was a major water problem at the end of my triangle property line and the three existing houses on the left side of my property line. Over here? So, yeah, I'm right there, but okay. the left side yeah. where that rock wall goes into the woods. This one here. No, I'll it's actually no right. If you future, okay. This is the south side of my line, and it goes up here. But when they put Rocky Road in, the water flooded my yard uh, a good ways up, and uh, Kathy and Sylvia that live here, it flooded the whole back of their yard, which it ran over. So they put a retention pond in that really doesn't work properly, and there's, I don't know who's supposed to monitor it. And the water, when it fills up, it means it comes in. We all get water. This, these houses that are existing get water in. That brown cake that's mm -hmm. going to be torn down, mm -hmm. they get quite a bit of water <coughs> in the basement there. And it rolls in down the driveway into the garage, and I go Smitty for, I've been there over 30 years. Yeah. So I know what the problem is. And the other thing is they're talking about traffic. If there's any kind of a snowbank whatsoever, my wife cannot pull out of my driveway and turn left on the Main Street because you can't see the traffic coming up from Franklin Street. So what you have to do in the wintertime is look at the light down at Franklin Street and wait till the last car comes through, and then you mark that. And when you see it go by my driveway, now you can at least pull out, and but now you're doing this 30, 40 times to get out. It could take six or seven minutes to pull up. So uh, I'm concerned about that because you're talking about sight lines. And people, as Karen said, 40 is, is not existent anymore. At 50, you will get out of the way. And, and in the mornings, it's just as bad. In the mornings, there's less traffic. Mm -hmm. But the traffic is horrible, to you guys yeah. all know. And I've been over 30 years, and it used to be fine, and now it's four times worse. And, uh, but the other question I had is, is there was confusion on Rocky Road when they built it about how many trees and how, many, how much of the woodland was going to be torn down. Now, you had a chart up here that was colored and showed the existing woodlands in back of um, my house, this lot, and and where you're going to be putting the houses. I wondered how much of that tree line is going to come out. And so right now I look out my backyard and I see woods and trees and there's, there's uh, a big Placentia bush that goes along here that borders the existing brown cape that's there. Um, and then there's the rock wall that goes way down in, into here somewhere. And I'm wondering if they're going to destroy that rock wall, which is kind of nice. It's a guideline for people that are out there, at least a sense of direction. Follow the rock wall. It's going to go out to Main Street right here. And it's been there and undisturbed for, for 37, 35 years it's been there. So I'm wondering if, what they're going to do with that wall on my property line and what they tend to do on the north side of my property line, which is here. And when they built Rocky Road, there was a lot of blasting, mm -hmm. a lot of miscommunication, what days they were going to blast. The mirrors were cracking, and we were worried about water, and we had more water than we did before. You got downgrade, but if these pump systems 
don't work, you grind the pumps for probably one year of service and you throw them away. And I'm in the pump business. A, a, a pump station at the end of this road to be built and, and take all of this, these houses, have one pump station that pumps it out to Main Street, and then eventually um, the town would take over the station or the homeowners would take over the station. But one pump station would be better off than grinding pumps in these houses. They'll live to regret it, the people that buy this. And, and I know that because I'm in that business. But it's just, you know, a lot of things you see, you, you come to meetings, and then when it comes to fruition, it's changed. We had to call the con conservation committee come down because the guy that developed that rocky road on my property line, just on the other side, was cutting down trees that were 18 and 24 inches in diameter, leaving the stumps in the ground and then coming up with the, with the raised the, the uh, ground level, coming up. And, and finally we made them take the stumps out and put the retaining spawn in. It fell by the wayside during the building. And it's on the other side of the street. And there's a pipe that goes from the, my backyard out to Rocky Road so that the water drains from my backyard to the retainer's pond and doesn't go mm -hmm. into the properties to my north. And that, that pipe that cracked, the yards all filled up again with water, so they had to come down and dig the pipe out and replace it. So, I mean, when you get water up there, we get water. There's a lot of ledge, and there's only so many places for the water to go. It follows the ledge. Go ahead. Okay, Judy, can you go to the Can you go to the Do you know when Rocky Road was built? When that? 20 years. 20 or 20, huh? Yeah, 20 or 25 years ago, I would say. Thank you. Just to be quick. So we, we did look at trees. So what we'll do, guys, we'll show the trees on the property and we'll show a no disturb line just in here. And I think we, here's the wall here. Yeah. It runs here in this manner, and then at this point it butts on our property. Uh, you know, we don't plant a gravy on that, and I think it's fine because in the conditions that wall is not to be touched as part of construction. If we weren't that line, if we disturb that wall, it would be disturbing the budding property anyway. So, and I'll draw, I want to make sure we have a limited construction line. We hear and save what we can about the property. With the mm -hmm. new trees we're looking at, we show that in the plan. As far as the runoff goes, everything is coming to us yeah. this way, so. We, we counted that in our green study. We have watershed maps that uh, we figured out what's coming at us and we're trying to mitigate that. And our concern is, is not let these basements flood. That's why they will stay up higher. We don't want to sink in the ground in there. You hit your water table and drains issues. So it's all part of the design. So, um, as far as the grinder pumps, um, I'll work that out with engineering. Um, if he's okay with P1 individual pumps, we'll, we'll stay that route. Uh, Pete wants to go to one. But so far, he gave me the uh, okay on what we've shown here. All right, just to reiterate, though, that the grinder pumps are a sewage issue, and right. the drainage system itself is all gravity exactly. to the detention right. pond and the um, right. We're not contacts in the right. front. Right. So you're saying that your drainage design takes into account what's happening uphill from you? Yeah, so in a failure want, mode? Excuse me? Because apparently, well, according to they, this gentleman, it's might failing. Be, yeah, so when we do our analysis, we look at our before and after. So um, uh, pre-development, we, we, we kept what's coming through wetlands here, but we have to look what's coming our way here too. So you know it's coming our way, and when we design it, we have to mitigate it. The two, five, ten, twenty-five, hundred-year storm is part of our drainage plan, um, which energy can to reduce. So yeah, we have to keep in mind what's coming at us, and then what's leaving the site into the wetland system. And it's all. Um, as far as the uh, drain system goes, you know, it's, it's meeting what's required. And I know uh, Ryan Chris, when I reviewed it, he was satisfied as to, to our design. So, yeah, we do take an account for budding properties. Okay. Any other comments? Please address them to the board. Um, yeah, real thing. Uh, 51 Mill Street. Um, I'm a member of the Trails Committee, and I've um, already talked to John a little bit about the, the trail. Um, up through there. I know that he's talking with the Conservation Commission about the trail.
Trail Eastman uh, were dealing with, with a similar situation on Kylie Drive, that's pre-existing Trail Eastman. We're trying to nail down the details um, so that the Trail Eastman remains in perpetuity. Um, <coughs> on Kylie Drive, they'll be putting in concrete bounds. It's actually a 10-foot wide Trail Eastman there. Um, so this is a little bit different situation with concrete bounds are a permanent marker that are easy for um, pedestrians to see as they're um, walking up the trail. Um, I personally, I don't see any possibility of that property in behind being developed. It's, it's conservation land. would have to go through the state legislature to get it changed because of the funding used to purchase the property. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I just think of it as a, as a part of Kirching Woods. Is, there is a connection, um, and we have worked on a, a trail plan um, in right in behind this development um, to just give more places for people to, to walk their dogs and things. Um, the issue of parking, you know, at, at that trailhead, um, we have a, a parking area on Franklin Street that accesses Christian Woods. Um, I rarely, if in, ever, see any cars in that parking lot. <coughs> it's mostly just used by local residents that walk walk their dogs in. Um, so I don't really see an issue with extra traffic being generated. Uh, but it is good, nonetheless, to have that area for your car off the uh, cul de sac. Um, actually, you know. I can understand the issues with cars having visibility issues coming in or out of there. Well, having one wider road um, versus two small driveways seems like it would improve the safety situation there. Um, although one thing I might suggest is to go the 30-foot <coughs> wide roadway near the entrance to Main Street, but then bring it down to 24 feet further in, because every time you you reduce the impervious surface, <coughs> you've got less issues with infiltration. And, um, so I, I'm always in favor of smaller roads, especially in areas in the, near the buffer zones in conservation. I'm always kind of frustrated by the, you know, the engineering requirements for these large roadways and cul-de-sacs. Um, so I, I would certainly <coughs> maybe consider it that as a Yeah, that's, that's um, well, the only other <coughs> comment I had was on grinder pumps. They installed those in three houses on Mill Street in 2001. They're downhill from us, down near the Ipswich River. And I speak with all the homeowners down there, and I've never heard of any problems with them. Obviously, if you've got a power outage, you need to have either backup power or not use your plumbing. <laughs> um, but the, as I say, I haven't heard of any issues. I haven't had to dig them up or replace them. 15 years, so that's the extent of my comments. Thanks. Do you have backup power? <laughs> yeah, it's really we proposed backup power for the pumps, but, 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 but that's a reason of failure. So, uh, but so what would that be? What's, what mean? would the backup power be? A single generator or? Probably, yeah, just think about it. These, <coughs> these, you know, they're tanks, so then they'll be pumped out. So there is some storage, some storage to it, and it gets pumped out. So, um, but We'll keep in mind backup power. I'll converse with Ryan about that and see his requirements out. Like he still wants to see all the specs through before he officially approves it. So we'll make sure uh, he's satisfied. So there's this single generator that's mm. maintained and exercised and owned by whom? The homeowner. Each homeowner? Each homeowner has this. Yeah, each homeowner has this. This would be his force main to drive it to here. And within that would be. The, uh, the pump. So each each one has its own integral pump. Yeah, but who's where's the backup power? So you have to have generator within the house itself would supply power back to, probably in the basement back to the uh, the uh, pump right here. Are you bringing gas up to these houses? So yeah, we, we didn't show you. I know uh, Ryan asked for what would be be doing showing uh, electrical and gas. Um, 
to the lines to the street, along with, um, as I mentioned, uh, lights. We do propose three lights. We just haven't, we haven't uh, locked in with the uh, lighting department yet. So yeah, we'll, lights, gas, electrical will be brought to the other cul-de-sac. See, Julie, now here's a real opportunity for your solar, is to do cogen in each of these houses. The small cogen units where they're, you know, they're producing their own power and heat, gas-fired giants. Mm -hmm. That's really efficient. That's green. And they'd have their own backup power. Yeah. And these houses are also oriented <laughs> with their main roofs <laughs> facing south. certain things that you can try to regulate with subdivision control and there are certain things that you can't really do. Well, they need to have backup power, right? They have to have at least a generator that runs that pump. It seems foolish to just put in a generator that's only running the pump because you could sell it as a feature, you know, for this house to have its own backup power. So that generator should be large enough to operate most of the house. It's not going to be that much larger. Thoughts? Mm -hmm. Not the concern for with the uh, consult with the uh, the applicant about that. Other comments? No oh, butters with concerns? Buffers? Drainage should be. Meeting, excuse me, when is the next meeting be? Uh, we'll probably decide that right now. Actually, one thing I wanted, I was thinking you should do is to go through the draft decision and the comments that I made. Okay. Some of them um, would be guidance to the applicant before the next meeting can decide to agree on that suggestion. It's so it's all the stuff that I underlined. Um, starting on page three with number seven. It seems, sounds like you guys have agreed to allow for the um, analysis of that intersection to be provided versus a full traffic study. Traffic analysis, correct. Right, okay. Um, do you think you'll be able to show the street lighting by the next time? Um, yeah, we'll show the plan, but I don't, you know, we're still probably working with it, the light department, but okay. I'll contact them. You know, we know the spacing, what we'll do. So you're going to provide a landscape plan? Will you be providing a landscaping plan? I don't know. Probably not. I mean, we, we show the, the only landscape we're proposing is just in the right way to propose trees. Uh, we, we show box houses. I don't know like, what, what these houses may end up looking like. Um, so, but I can provide um, limit cutting, existing tree location, what we plan to say. Um, I can provide out a plan showing that and with these trees on it. But as far as individual landscaping, it used to look, probably not. What about screening? What about at least screening for those houses that are right up against? Yeah. Yeah, we can, I can look at what we have, the okay. trees, and then I can coordinate with you as um, some type of screening if you need to with that. I think the issue is probably these two lots here. Yeah. This one. What is the setback on that number one lot? This one here? Yeah, from the property to its um, 20, I believe south. it's... Um, This looks narrow, and I'm wondering, are you considering that the side line or the rear line? Is the south property line of that number one lot considered the rear line? Yes. Okay. All right. 
Or as long as it complies with that. So it would need to be 20. Yeah, it's 20, 20, 20 feet inside. So this is 21 feet. Okay. So we're just under it. So there may not be an official landscaping plan, but there needs to be something that shows buffers, these street trees, and uh, I mean, it could be a big combination plan, I guess, yeah, that shows. Yeah, we'll show the install the law to the same additional screener, and we'll have lot one and two, and proposed street trees. So we'll just go ahead and call it. We'll, we'll add a plan to it, sir. Okay. <coughs> Would we be happier if the if we uh, required um, not six inch plan, but for uh, pick a bigger number, twelve inch, eighteen inch? As the um, inventorying all of the, I mean, a six inch tree isn't very big, and there's a lot of them. But if we're talking about impact where they might touching one of the 12 to, to 20 inch. I think they're already, they've already inventory. Yeah, we did. We, yeah, they did. We decided to go ahead and do with it. They did. Okay. The conservation requires it, although the difference, there's a slight difference right. because subdivisions say six mm -hmm. inch caliper. Right. And the conservation commission Seven. says okay. 16, sorry, six inch DBH, which is diameter at breast height. So it's, it's a, a different measurement. <laughs> right. So we won't consider a six inch you know, caliper. We did caliper. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You saw this re this request to have the uh, O and M plans and SOPs for the pump stations included in the closing documents. Right. <coughs> we talked a little bit about backup power to that, but it says. Um, there's no utility shown on the drawings, so you'll have to start showing that. Well, I'm assuming everything is underground. You'll be running all the utilities underground? That's correct. Again, another, some more language for the homeowners to understand how to, what's going on around them for those infiltration basins. when we get more information after they meet with conservation, so that can be later. Okay. Um, same with the road, roadway easement and trail language. Okay, so waivers, we already talked about the first waiver being taken off the table because that was for the trees. Um, a waiver from a full traffic study, but we're still doing some sort of traffic analysis. So do we want to keep that there and just reword it? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the actual requirement is for a traffic study, so they would still need that waiver even if they did like a smaller analysis. Right, okay. But we could say that they're going to provide the okay. analysis or whatever. Um, Town engineer wants sidewalks on both sides. Why do they want sidewalks on both sides? It's from Cave Paradise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh. Now, is anyone here opposed to having a sidewalk on just one side? Oh, no. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it looks like the detention basin slope and the drainage pipe materials are going to be okay as well. Got some work to do. Curious in here, does it say or did did you say um, the expected expected square footage of the houses? Right, that's not. You're just showing a 
a, a block of where the house right. would it's fit within. Twenty nine square feet. And these boxes themselves are twenty nine square feet. So Oh they are. Yeah. So okay. they're they're oversized. We could you can see, you know, assuming walkways, patios. Yeah. 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 So we yeah. oversized. So our house would fit inside that. that yes, that's what I had to expect. Okay. Anything okay. else? Any last comments? It's administratively, we continue the hearing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. give a sense if you file with confirmation on Wednesday, will you be on their first meeting in February? Second? Second. Second. Oh, no, sorry. The eighth. Yeah, that was that that's what I thought. The first meeting in February. Um, we have meetings on February 13th and February 27th. Um, the 13th is very full, and it might be too soon. Yeah, I think the 27th. Depending on. Yeah, I mean these changes are going to be really quick, but we still haven't met with them. I don't know. Right. Um, Um, I mean, the 27th is better, but we can we can always have it be a tentative placeholder, and then if you don't feel like you're ready. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll be ready. I just I know okay. there's some there's some deadlines that you have to meet, so I, okay. I don't want to keep pushing it back if we right. can get in that first meeting. But won't you need the information to change um, it by? Pretty soon, you know. It's I don't know that that's. If they're on the 27th. Oh, are we talking about the 13th? We're talking about the 27th, yeah. right? Are you saying you want it early on the 13th? Early 13th. Yeah, okay. he's saying we'll oh, see yeah. the 13th. I mean, that I, meeting is I super I thought you full. said that was already full. It's a, it's we, a super yeah. full meeting. It'll be extremely late night. February 28th. February 27th. Sorry, 27th. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is that okay, time-wise? I mean, technically, this board has 135 days from when you filed, so let's just make that put okay. that out there on the table. Right. We'll do the. It's just okay with that. That's fine. Okay. All right. There's a holiday in between there yeah. too, so. So we'll. we'll you may need through, that time. We'll be through conservation, and then we'll, you know make their changes, and then submit the plans to you. So I think by then we'll close okay. down some of that. Yeah, I think, think think that's the biggest piece is whatever conservation has to say because it sounds like engineering is on board as long as you've proved some things to them. Mm -hmm. You still have to work th through those. And we're not going to change the roadway width at this point. I don't think. I think it's. I think it's too much of a headache yeah. to get back to engineering with that. Yeah. Okay. Move the or move yeah. that we close the. Nope. No. no. Just uh, continue it. Move, Move to continue. continue. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> continue the public hearing for the uh, subdivision project at 1260, 1264 Main Street until Monday, February 27th. Yeah. Time to be determined. I have to look at the agenda. We have a lot of stuff going on in February. So. Uh, no sooner than 8 o'clock. We just list the time. That's it doesn't matter. It's a safe right? assumption, yeah. <coughs> okay. Okay. yeah. Is there a second? Second. Yes. <laughs> you get your name. All in favor? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anything else? Can I dismiss Jeff? About gratitude? How does that work? I don't know. You just walk away. Music <laughs> 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 plays and the lights dim and stuff. <laughs> I see like my windows, though. I don't know if everyone knows. Heard that. Okay. These small kids that live in my house are taking up an inordinate, an inordinate amount of time. This is Jeff's so. last mission, uh, last last meeting, so there'll be an open seat. I'm just saying. <laughs> it's a very different board of selectmen. That whole board turned over. Board of selectmen has turned over since the last time. Yeah, I know. This one hates me more. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you.
No, we so haven't. Is there anything else? Just call me, okay? Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Definitely Thanks, Jeff. Second, been great. second the motion Appreciate to adjourn. It. All right, is there a motion? Motion. Move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Good. It's been good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I will. Absolutely. Something. I'll see you guys in touch.